Hello and welcome. I'm excited to have you today on this episode of Viewpoint on the Ask Krishna channel. We are doing a thorough Q&A on the concept of surrender, sharanagati, bhakti or devotion, moksha or liberation, and very importantly, the applicability of those concepts in contemporary life and for the young adult of today. I'm truly privileged to have Professor Francis Clooney on the show. Professor Clooney is the leading figure globally in the developing field of comparative theology. Frank joined the Harvard Divinity School faculty in 2005, where he is the Parkman Professor of Divinity and Professor of Comparative Theology. He has spent years going deeper into the Sanskrit and the Tamil traditions of Hindu India. Frank is the author of numerous articles and books, including Thinking Ritually, Retrieving the Purva Mimamsa of Jaimini, Theology After Vedanta, An Experiment in Comparative Theology, and many, many, many more books. Frank's deep research on the Vaishnava, Sri Vaishnava and the Advaitic traditions have enabled him to look at the world from a pan-religion and a common tradition perspective. Frank continues to follow the traditional upbringing he had in his life and is a Roman Catholic priest and is a member and has been a member of the Society of Jesus. He serves regularly on the, in a Catholic parish on the weekends. One thing about Frank is with his intense research and knowledge, he is able to speak rationally, link the concept of the scriptures to the current day generation and go deeper into the actual meaning, which is what we do on this channel. So before we go further and get talking to Frank, don't forget to subscribe to the Ask Krishna channel and support this channel so that we can have many more of the spiritually rich videos that allow you to live a life of faith, free from fear, and live a life of common sense and rationality, living your life to the fullest without any guilt, but at the same time, look towards a better today and a better tomorrow. Let's now talk to Professor Clooney or Frank. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today uh, on this Ask Krishna channel uh, and really looking forward for a full one hour of an exciting Q&A on some very important topics of bhakti, surrender, sharanagati, karma, you name it. Um, I don't think uh, there is any topic that is off limits for you with your with your background and knowledge uh, but we'll keep this interactive again there's no right or wrong answer it's all about perspectives so really looking forward for that thank you Mage. thank you for the invitation we did this a while back and it's nice to be back with you on the screen and to have this important conversation so i'm looking forward to our hour together excellent excellent so uh, I know I've given you I've given a whole intro about you on the channel, so that will that will also accompany this uh, broadcast. Uh, so I want I don't want to use your precious time uh, doing a full intro on this because that precedes this uh, this broadcast anyway. So okay. let's get straight into the topic uh, in the interest of time and to maximize the time even for our viewers. This concept of surrender, Frank, has been it's one of those things which i feel people love it to listen to it to to hear about it but struggle to actually put that into action so let's start with the very basics in your view having gone deeper into ramanuja's view and also having really went gone into the depths of shankara and madhva in your view what does surrender mean I think in general terms, but certainly um, more from the perspective of Ramanuja's tradition, the Sampradaya, and also the, um, 
the commentators, you know, the the Vedanta Deshika, Pillai Lokacharya, the, the great Acharyas to follow in the footsteps of Ramanuja, the tension is is one familiar to those of us who grew up in the in the West and with uh, Christian tradition and so forth. The tension between doing what you can and depending on your own energies and powers uh, for even for the good, and and putting everything into the hands of God or the higher power. And I think the 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 English word, which is obviously a limited word, surrender has to do with uh, giving oneself over totally to the Lord, uh, to let the Lord run one's life, to be uh, one's refuge, and to allow, therefore, the action and the good deeds that one does afterwards uh, to follow from this uh, basic act of trust in the Lord. So uh, words that I think the audience will be very familiar with, like sharanagati, uh, taking refuge at the feet of the Lord, as we see even in Bhagavad Gita 1866, the Charma Shloka, uh, the notion of Bharanyasa, uh, taking the burden off your back and, and laying it down so one doesn't have to carry it anymore. Uh, Prapati, uh, which is related to the, the notion of just being at the feet of the Lord, letting oneself surrender in the Lord's presence. All of these are ways of talking about the fact that one cannot really accomplish the greater goals of life uh, freedom, loss of anxiety, compassion toward the neighbor, on and on by one's own effort because we're finite, we're good and we're bad at the same time. But if giving oneself over to the Lord completely through this act of refuge or surrender is really the way forward. And I think that's really what the term surrender is me meant to, to hold on to, is the range of meanings related to not depending on karma, or one's activities, but rather on what one does, the Lord does by prasad, by the grace that is given. So I'd start with that, but I can certainly clarify further. No, that's that's good. And I think you set the stage there. Just one clarity though, as you describe that, you use the term Lord, uh, or depends on how people use that, but essentially it implied that there is, some entity out there mm -hmm. in a physical in a physical form uh, what is is that a requirement for surrender to to think that there is an entity somewhere out there don't know where but mm -hmm. but with with a name and a form to whom we surrender mm -hmm. i'm not even mm -hmm. going on a gender but i'm just calling it as an yeah. entity yeah yeah i i would say that uh two clarifications i mean one clarification is that so the word lord or often a translation of ishvara or bhagwan um needn't be taken in a in a simply uh, deistic sense of i am here and the god is there so out there somewhere traditionally people have said well up there somewhere but rather if one takes seriously the vedanta tradition of ramanuja in a sense we are uh within the reality of the lord uh you know the the uh, achit chit ishvara relationship means that we are part of the reality of God already and not relating to a being who is far and away, far away from us. So that's the first clarification that it needn't be this uh, here, there, down, up kind of relationship. But I think it also needn't be uh, specifically or only uh, conceived of as a uh, personal relationship with a deity. Um, and for instance, take uh, Shankara's tradition, the Advaita tradition, where there's a certain sense that you know the the illusion of how the world is to us and the way we think about it, our identity, our name, our form, uh, social identity, religious family identity, caste, and so on like that, all of these features are the things people cling to and hold on to because this makes me an important person. This makes me famous. This makes me respected by others, and so on. And it seems to me that in the core of Shankara's Vedanta, uh, there is a sense that through trust in the guru, going to one's teacher, one has to let go of this small marginal identity crowded into my little life where I'm this and I'm that. And in a sense, a surrender to the greater reality, the mystery of life. So. And there, it's we could talk about that for an hour, uh, Advaita and Vishishtadvaita, 
But I think my point is simply that it doesn't have to relate to a, a, a deity of some sort who's a specific reality out there, but rather either within the reality of God or rather breaking down false understandings of reality for a deeper, full understanding of reality. Those would be features, and, and they sound easy, but uh, the further thing I suppose I could say is that it really has to do in every case with uh, letting go of the ego. Uh, and the ego is very self-protective. We're afraid to give up who we are. And however the traditions talk about this, it's going from this kind of protective ego identity to a much more universal identity beyond the limits of my small life self in this lifetime. So Frank, on that note, how would you, um, we all live in an age here where the newer generation or the younger generation hasn't had a, I could say, a, a grounding in many ways of a traditional discipline in, in many cases. I'm not generalizing it, but that's, I'm just going by pure empirical research that keeps coming out, right? Mm. Like you and I probably as kids, we were going to church or a temple and some, all of those, but the newer generation isn't in that kind of a mode. Uh, doesn't mean they're not charitable, doesn't mean they're not compassionate, doesn't mean they're not helpful, they're doing all of those. But for somebody like that, uh, based on what you just said, how would they now even visualize or conceptualize this concept of surrender? Like what would surrender for that Harvard graduate actually mean? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this is a very large issue, of course, that I think um, we need to be thinking about is that every generation has to give new energy, new definition to the terms we use in a familiar fashion. I don't think the truth changes over time. Uh, there's a deep truth to reality that's not gonna change between 1950, 1970, 2000, 2024. But as you just said very well, the, the framework in which we grow up, uh, the culture, and certainly for me growing up, uh, Roman Catholic in New York City in the 1950s and 60s, it was very much a church-going culture, hearing the priest preaching, uh, getting religious education, and, and a fairly traditional American sense of Catholicism. So working with that, uh, I think, you know, gave a certain framework in which it gave me an ability to understand what, we're, what I'm talking about when I talk about surrender or grace or the love of God and so on. And then it opened the door for me to learn from Hindu traditions like that of Ramanuja that there are similar aspects of grace, God's presence, God taking over one's burdens and so on. But you're right that with younger people today, uh, without that traditional upbringing, either yours or mine or other, then there has to be a further explanation that is not clinging to old images that don't work anymore. So you know, famously in the Christian tradition, you know, people always joke about, oh, God is the old man with a long beard. And obviously, no one took that too seriously. But the idea that you can't cling to these images that don't even work anymore. And I would think that for young people today, let's say young Hindus uh, in the United States, um, the, the impact of going to the temple, of, of visiting, you know, you, everybody drives over, you go in for darshan, and then you go home, is not going to be the same as the impact is in the village or a traditional setting where you can go any day into the holy space. But I think the problems of life haven't changed that much, whether one is 70 or 50 or 30 or 18, that in terms of the issues I mentioned earlier about uh, you know, fear of loss of identity, ego, uh, desire for reputation, desire for security, and then realizing that life is short, we're surrounded by all kinds of things that can go wrong, that there has to be some sense of, can I break out of this traditional can I break out of my small identity into a larger sense where ultimately everything is well, that things are taken care of because reality and God are gracious. There's a great mercy in the universe. Um, and But the problem is, and I think you're asking this, we can talk more about this, how does one communicate that without relying on images that made more sense in 1950, 1960, 1970? But I think we, we run into the same problem of the Bhagavad Gita, the gospel, uh, the Quran, other sacred texts were not written 
composed for us now. And we have to cross the gap, realizing that they contain e you know, eternal and lasting wisdom that work today, but it requires effort, working with translations, you know, learning language, uh, figuring out whatever they were talking about. Just to give one example, again, I'm sorry to keep referring to the Shankara tradition, uh, but I've been teaching uh, in one of my courses, we've been reading part of the Upadesha Sahasri of Shankara, uh, the thousand teachings, and the teacher is trying to guide the student through a long process of realizing who he is and who he is not. And the teacher keeps pushing back against the student saying, you describe yourself as a male, as a Brahmin with a certain education, with a certain standing, my father was so-and-so, my grandfather was so-and-so, all these things you say about yourself. But then you also say, I am the eternal self. And don't you realize that the things you said first about identity pass away? And then there's a deeper reality about you, which does not pass away. Now, to be explaining this to Harvard students in 2024, uh, whether they're Hindu or Christian or spiritual but not religious or entirely secular but curious, uh, raises basic questions like, what are they talking about? Why are they using that language? And yet I think I have a confidence, and I think people like myself and you have a confidence that the great wisdom doesn't go away. We just have to be able to be humble enough to teach it in new ways in our time and place. That's that's excellent. That's excellent. Um, that leads me to a couple more thoughts. And you you brought up Shankara again, which is, by the way, I, I really, my personal belief is uh, if it was not for Shankara, we wouldn't have had this opportunity to explore further. Uh, mm -hmm. It's always like uh, very easy to be a critic versus a creator. And in many ways, uh, Shankara being uh, in many ways opening up the doors and leveraging the Upanishads and then Ramanuja coming on, I think really mm -hmm. helped streamline and refine it. Then of course, went on further with um, yeah. Maddoa coming along. Um, your perspective, back keeping on the track of surrender. Now you, you have Ramanuja's philosophy, clearly to your point, you explained it very well about not just necessarily thinking there's a theistic lord over there, uh, but but it's more of, we are all part and parcel of it, integrated into it. Um, but then now when you go further down that uh, chain of thought, there's this element of religious aspect that gets introduced into surrender. Um, whether whether you go further down, then this aspect of moksha comes into into play. Where mm -hmm. to to gain moksha, the only option is you surrender. But then mm -hmm. moksha becomes almost like what I think uh, Karl Marx said. I guess right. It's like the carrot you dangle, uh, and and the reason you surrender is you because you got to you got to have to get moksha. You have to surrender. Mm -hmm. Your your mm -hmm. perspectives on that, like, why did that even come through? Like, if if we really believe in Krishna, the Gita, where where outcome is never defined or certain, then how come we are so certain that moksha is confirmed if you surrender? Well, I think um, this is another very good and and um, interesting question because there are so many dimensions to it. We talk about eternal truths, but I think we should be willing to talk about them in the particular cultural, linguistic, philosophical context in which the text we're reading takes place. So, you know, we don't, if you go back, let's say 3000 years in India, we don't know what most people were doing every day in the village. Um, you know, the Sanskrit texts that are composed, uh, the, the Vedas, the Aranyakas, the Brahmanas, the Upanishads, the Gita, Mahabharata, and so on, are not really dedicated to describing everyday life of ordinary people. So these are specialized texts that are very intense, and they're meant to really push people forward in a very powerful way. But you can see in the context of ancient India that there's already, even by the time of the Rig Veda, and then more clearly by the time of the Upanishads, there are social structures that are religious and social, uh, family and sacrificial at the same time. 
so the the varnashrama system so that there are stages of life uh famously the brahmachari the grihastha the vanaprastha and the sannyasi and then those are intertwined with the varna system uh, which can be taken literally or maybe spiritualized of the brahman the kshetriya the vaishya the shudra uh, there's a very strong sense of the enormous body of vedic rituals uh, both daily rituals like the Agnihotra sacrifice, uh, rituals related to birth, Upanayana, marriage, death ceremonies, and then great sacrifices related to the Darsha Purnamasa, seasons of the year, uh, the anointing of a new king, and so on. All of this is in place. And I think already, you know, long before the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads are questioning who are any of us in relationship to that great body of ritual obligations and the tension in the Upanishads is how to say this something more without simply casting aside a great tradition of ritual obligations and so the whole quest in you know old Upanishads like Brihadaranyaka, Chandogya, later Upanishads like the Kattu Upanishads, Vritashvatara Upanishad and so on are all trying to find a balance where uh, karma, karma, yog, karma yajna, sacrifice matters without saying that's it, that's all there is, because that seemed to be related to this idea that you kind of recycle. Uh, you go to Swarga, you go to Naraka, then you come back into the world again, and you do it again and again and again. Isn't there more? And then this quest and promise held out about the self, uh, the eternal self, a realization of self as an immortal, re immortal reality. Well, that comes to the fore, and that's balanced with the older system, and so to be identified with a social condition and yet saying there's more to me than that. And then as, as time goes on and the epics come in, the Itihasa, uh, again, the Gita, Ramayana, and so on, then there's some other element that seems to come in that there's a, a more intense experiential element of love or compassion or dedication that's somehow more simply at the center of life. And then you see, you know, a text like the Bhagavad Gita coming along, which is cry, trying very hard to balance uh, the ancient karma, the Vedic rituals, yoga practice, the knowledge of the Upanishads, uh, the Buddhist path of simplicity, all of that kind of being balanced in a way that social structures exist, and yet one does not become a prisoner of social structures. And so I think all of these things begin to fall into place as socially conditioned and related to one another, even in the time of the Bhagavad Gita, Ramayana, and so on. And then people begin to, to organize life in terms of immediate goals. You might say kama and artha, uh, things one desires, things one wants because they're pleasurable, things that lead to stability and prosperity, such artha, wealth, position, job, house, and so on. And then the, the, the rules and regulations and concerns that don't go away, the dharma, both personal and uh, the swadharma, the dharma of the family, the dharma of society, all these elements are put together and seen in these texts. But you're asking, you know, where does moksha come in? And I think there's a quest that's as old as the Upanishads, but you see it in the Gita and other texts, where there's something more that's wanted uh, that is defined by something that is not limited to this birth, this birth, this death, and something that's kind of an ultimate freedom. Some of the texts say very little about it. They say, um, it's not what you experience now. And that sounds very Buddhist. It's not this, it's not that, neti neti. And other texts will talk about ananda, this great bliss that comes over you. You're part of the great ocean of bliss. But I think they're struggling not simply to conceptualize uh, you know, there's something up high in the sky out there, or uh, as you say, the, the carrot that's held out there to make you be a good person, but that our consciousness is, it deeply demands something more than what's right before our eyes and our five senses. And that kind of conviction that you see east and west, north and south in our globe, I think is a sense that um, there is, a, you know, whether you call it moksha, nirvana, salvation, whatever, there's something else that's not reducible to what we can talk about right now. Um, I think it's very, as, as you were sharing that, I couldn't help but just go through the sequence of how you described 
uh, things evolving over time because you're you're i think it's absolutely spot on because when i look at like the isha keno kato prashna you you go through that and it's all about realization self brahman and and there's a lot more focus then you get to brihadaranyaka and chandogya there's a little bit introduction of personalities right whether it is whether mm. it's nachiketa or whoever else you you have an introduction of personalities and then then you then go back again to taittiriya and others again it goes back to more of the brahman approach so um i could very much as you were sharing that i couldn't help but relate it to that mm-hmm. cycle that would have evolved probably over time yeah. where the need of the day and age was uh, uh, the need of the day and age put the emphasis on where that has to be there mhm mhm yeah and and you you know mentioned you know the the very old brihadaranyaka upanishad and you know one of the most interesting persons in all the upanishads is yajnavalkya yeah and yajnavalkya is this um towering figure um you know in the, in the brihadaranyaka itself he you know tells maitreyi and kadyayani i'm going to leave i'm going off and that opens the door in his conversation with maitreyi about w- why are you going who are you what are you leaving behind for us what is the wisdom and then you have the great encounters you know with all the brahmans uh, one by one in janaka's presence uh, probing the meaning of life and then janaka and yajnavalkya him- together the two of them talking more and more deeply about um life and death about deep sleep about renunciation all of these things are there in the story and you can sort of see the journey of someone like yajnavalkya from being a prosperous householder to being a person who at the end of uh brahmadaranyaka 4 simply leaves many people don't realize and and this can be pointed out and and easily documented that even in the older shatapata brahmana uh of which the brahmadaranyaka is really the last part yajnavalkya is also a brilliant ritualist uh, he knows the puzzles he knows the answers he's already competing with the other uh brahmans he always has a clever thing to say and so on like that and you get a sense of a man who's fairly well established in life it, it doesn't say anything about him having children but he and kadyayani and maitreyi seem to be prosperous householders and then you see in the upanishad that something else is happening and that there's a sense of his inkling in his mind this life as we experience it and the prosperity i have are not enough and there's something more So I I think tracing the life of an individual like that as you say and then you could talk about Udalika and Nachiketas um Nachiketas in the Katya Upanishad you could talk about Shweta Ketu in the Chandogya Upanishad people who are being shown to us and and going on journeys um and I think maybe that's a very effective way to think about this you have as you say like Kena Upanishad has very little storyline except in the last part or the prashna mundika upanishad very little in terms of personalities but seeing it in terms of personality helps you and me but also maybe helps young people to look and say well can, can i 3000 years later be like that person can i raise those kinds of questions and then how to do it in the language you know, most of us are as we're doing right now english language becomes dominant how to use the english language in a way that has spiritual meanings um when it's often being trashed and used in very non-spiritual ways and since we are on the topic of upanishads how do you reconcile frank that some of the upanishads go into um some very specifics like um if i'm remembering correctly it's the brother and nick or the chandogya which one i think it is more of the of the former into some specifics of hey if you want to uh, like childbirth and if you want to have a uh, have a boy this is what you got to do if you want to have a girl this is what you got to do uh, how do you reconcile that do you think that's just an outlier that has crept in the scriptures over time and and not really the original intention uh, of course these books undergo changes so how do you reconcile that yeah yeah well i mean that's all in the the, the very Yeah, you know, I mean the the puzzling parts of the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad which is the I think the largest of all the Upanishads probably larger than the Chandogya as well. Um but but we have a sense with it 
that there's a, a way in which however one thinks of Shruti or the original revelation, you might say, that there seem to be stages in the Upanishad. Um, as, they, as we just agreed a few minutes ago, I think, at the core of it is the Yajnavalkya story, that those the Khandas three and four, where the, the great stories and great debates and all that. But much of the first two parts, Khanda one, Khanda two, uh, Khanda one, the chapters one and two, uh, seem to relate more to uh, pondering the meaning of creation, uh, the meaning of life in this world, the transition from sacrifice to uh, deeper penetration of, of the meanings of life, all kinds of speculations that seem to be very old and really more in the world of the Brahmanas. And then you get the great story of Yajnavalkya. And then, as you say, the, the, the third part, which is called the Kilakanda, which basically says, it means, I think, miscellany, uh, like the extra things that are left over have some beautiful sections, you know, talking about um, inquiring again into the meaning of the, the fires, the the five fires, inquiring about the meaning of who a performer is, what one gets by sacrifice. But then these very specific things about, as you say, about if you want to have a learned daughter, a daughter who's pandita, then you should do this. Um, if you're having troubles in your relationship with your spouse, you should do that. Um, and it's sort of unexpected. Uh, and when I teach a course on the Upanishads, we rarely get very deeply into those last parts. But perhaps it, it reminds us that it's not simply like a, an appendix, all this stuff stuck in so that it doesn't get lost, but to remind us that the people who are having these lofty thoughts about creation, about going to the forest, about the meaning of deep sleep and so on, are also people who had previously also been very concerned about marriage, family, children, education, uh, what to do about illnesses and so on. Because otherwise we could imagine the Upanishads are meant only for these you know, spiritual ethereal souls who are kind of floating in the forest. Maybe that last part is also a good reminder that these were people who had their feet on the ground, but also aspired to something more spiritual. And that analogs of, in other words, one could read the Upanishad backwards and start mm. with chapters five and six, mm. and then read chapters one and two, and then read about Yajnavalkya because he's sort of in the middle of this great story about the world and also about daily life. Uh, one more thing on surrender, and then I would like to move to Bhakti. Uh, but just on surrender, how important do you really believe, uh, back to again, keeping on the Upanishad train? Um, like the aspect of what Ishopanishad says towards the end, right? Where basically it's Basma Santam, Shariram, Kratosmara, Krutam Smara, Kratosmara, Krutam Smara, where let let this entire body and all the memories and the and the subtle mind, everything kind of burn out. How important do you believe it is that an individual has to really get to that state? Um wherein not only just believing and surrendering to El Supreme, but in addition to that, really getting to that ultimate state where nothing exists. I think, I mean, I, mean, I think there is a great um, challenge there of the fullness of the spiritual life. And I think it would be a very unfortunate development if we, you know, if you or I would judge ourselves or judge other people by saying, if you don't go all the way, then you're really wasting your time. I think we have to validate where people are on the spiritual path, how people find meaning in their lives, the good they do, uh, and so on and so on. But it does seem that um, there is the push, as you say, in the Isha Upanishad, um, Kena Upanishad, Brihadaranyaka, Chandogya, and, and even in the Gita, I mean, about this, ultimately it's all about Krishna that there is the great push to say, however, the road is still open before you, you can still go further. Um, not in the sense, you know, you just have to do more difficult things, but to truly know who you are, you have to do yourself the favor of letting go of who you think you are. You have to push and push and push. And that's very hard because it, to strip away cherished ideas about identity, about gender, about position in life, about fame, all those things have to be stripped away. 
I mean, I, I think I resonate with this well, if I may draw a comparative angle for a moment. Uh, this is at the heart of my Christian tradition as well. Because if you read the Gospels, uh, let's say take Luke or Matthew, uh, Jesus is very gentle with people, except if they seem to be hypocrites or you know, burdening other people. But for the most part, he, he'll talk to people and then they'll go home. Uh, he'll cure the blind man who goes home. He'll help the woman who's sick. She goes home back to her family. But he does say every now and then um, that there is a further path. Those who cling to their life will lose it. Those who dare to lose their life will gain it. Um, he puts it in terms of his own story. You too have to take up your cross and follow me. And, and that kind of formal, you know, formidable, even frightening image of dying and rising with Jesus is at the center of Christian faith. In, in John's gospel toward the, I think in the 12th chapter, he says, you know very well, you're all farmers. If the grain of wheat does not fall into the ground and die, the wheat will not grow up. And some sense of having to go, let go, go into the ground, be lost so that new life can come is not entirely different from saying you have to let go of identity, you have to let go of where you are in the world in order to go all the way with the absolute. It's sort of like the difference between taking a few dainty steps along the beach you're just putting your toes in the water and being willing to plunge into the great ocean. And I think the traditions are saying some people should go into the great ocean and not be afraid to go deeper and deeper than they think they can. That's, that's helpful, uh, Frank. Let's turn on to Bhakti. In, in your view, um, Let's start off with very basic difference between surrender and bhakti and is bhakti <clears throat> like one step below surrender or do they go hand in hand? This is a complicated question that as you know very well, I mean in the in the in Ramanuja's tradition, the Vaishnava traditions of both uh, Tamana, the Sri Vaishnava and then the Gaudiya Vaishnava of uh, Bengal. And then you can see elements of this in all the bhakti movements, you know, the flourishing of bhakti saints, Nirguna, Saguna in North India and so on like that. There's a tension between living a religious life that is dedicated to spiritual values, uh, having a way of living, a way of eating, a way of walking, a way of dressing, uh, what you do with your daily life, all of these things can become ritualized, and and ritualization is not a bad thing. One can you know, develop good habits about life, and I think what happened over time uh, seemed to be that just as you have the tension earlier we talked about between the Vedic rituals and all the rit rites and sacrifices that had to be done, and then the simpler path of wisdom or knowledge in the Upanishads, then there seemed to be, and you see this in the Bhagavad Gita certainly more broadly in the Mahabharata, Ramayana, other such texts, this idea that all of this can be turned toward Ishwara or Bhagawan. And this is often what gets formalized as the bhakti path, um, a way of life that has a, a spiritual goal to it, a participation in the reality of the God, Ishwara. And that that is defined in terms of ritual practices, devotions, um, acts of worship, uh, living a good, pious life, going to the temple, uh, darshan in the temple and so on. But I think, uh, ironically, it seemed to be, even in the Bhagavad Gita, a tension between all of that as a long list of things one ought to do, namely to be in the present, to be acting out religiously in this full way and a whole list of things you ought to do as a devotional person. Bhakti became itself almost as complicated as the old Vedic rituals or Upanishadic or yogic meditation. And there seemed to be a tension in the, let's say the Gita as a primary text between bhakti as a way of life, uh, bhakti as a, as a kind of program for living and something even simpler. So at several times in the Gita, um, for instance, the, at the end of the ninth chapter, Krishna says, well, even people who are not you know, uh, Brahmins or Kshatriyas, uh, people who are low caste, 
uh, women who are not allowed to study the Sanskrit, if they just come to me with love and devotion, with water, with a flower, that's enough. And sort of saying all the things you people do in terms of bhakti, prayers, nama, kirtanam, and all that isn't really as, as important as just an act of love. And then famously, what does the Charma Shloka mean? So the Sarva Dharma Paritya Mamekam Sharanam Raja, coming to the Lord, giving oneself over completely. Krishna seems to be saying at the end, you have your Dharma, you have your Swadharma, you have your way of life, all of these things. But if you want, you can just come to me directly. It's sort of like saying you can work your way up through the bureaucracy or you can just step around the bureaucracy and my door is open. You can always come to me directly. Why waste time with all of that? Famously, uh, in, in his commentary, the Gita Bhashya, Ramanuja has two interpretations of 1866, the Charma Shloka. And the first one seems to be in terms of ritual, all the devotional practices and so on that are very fine. And then the second one seems to be more a path of prapati. Mm -hmm. And I think kind of the inner logic of knowing Krishna is to know Krishna, to be with Krishna, surpasses all other obligations. But that perhaps for people who are um, not there yet, or people who don't think they can live on such a, you know, a rare level, um, there are temples, there are rituals, there are prayers, there are worship. And this again would be true in my tradition too. It's enough to say, love God and love your neighbor. And then here's a big fat book of all the things you should be doing if you're a devout person. So I think that is built into the Gita. And then you can see it in Ramayana with scenes where someone like um, Vibhishana comes to Rama and just surrenders to Rama. All the complications of the Orthodox life are often punctured by some scene, you know, Rama and Shabari in the forest. I mean, somebody who's outside the system in the simplicity of their love surpasses all the things that all the pious people do. And I think that's good that there's that ability to say, there's always going to be karma, jnana, bhakti, and then there's always going to be the possibility to be free in your direct experience of God, of ultimate reality. We, so you mentioned uh, Krishna a couple of times, and I have this belief that, and I did a video on this, by the way, um, that the Krishna of the Gita, is that really in all cases, if there was a Lord Krishna or is it actually a sage Krishna, where you have a sage Krishna who is imparting the wisdom of the Upanishads and where Krishna says, uh, come to me, then it is really a an example or, or, a, or a example of saying, hey, come to the Lord. But you, you have this distinction of a sage Krishna and almost like a divine Krishna. And I, mm. I, and I, 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 that's kind of the conclusion I came up to as I link Gita to the Upanishads is it's not the human Krishna there. It's that who is saying, come to me, but it is a sage like the Upanishadic sage, right? Like whether it is Mundaka, Mandukya, whoever you, you, you think about it as the sages same approach. Any thoughts on that? Like, I mean, because I struggle to, I struggle that Krishna as an individual would be saying, come to me, but mm -hmm. it is a sage guiding saying, come to the Lord. Yes. I mean, I think, um, and I would defer to you on this is knowing, knowing all of this very well, but from my perspective, first of all, there are, um, it, it perhaps is a, a, a a characteristic of any kind of guru tradition is that the guru is both a human being who's sitting there before you and has a certain character, a certain feature, a certain body, and says certain things with their own voice. And yet the belief that that is simply a conduit or an opening into some greater reality. And I think um, as, as Krishna says in chapter four of the Gita, you know, again and again, I come into the world, I come in a body. And then there are those who make light of my body, who despise the fact of this mere form of a charioteer and so on. So there's always going to be that element. But also, if one does, as I have not done, you know, read the entire Mahabharata, then uh, this Krishna also seems to be a prince. He has his own troops that come to the battlefield. 
Um, he strategizes. He he goes around the battlefield advising people and so on. Much of that can be seen as a human Krishna who comes from Dwaraka or somewhere in the Northwest, comes down as part of the um, story of the Mahabharata. And then in the Gita seems to be, uh, much of it can be explained in terms of being the wise advisor, almost like a, a counselor for Arjuna, helping him to deal with his grief, strategizing, getting him back up on his feet so that the course of the war can go forward. But I, I think there are some breakthrough scenes in the Gita that seem to go further. So first of all, when you know, I, I mention, I'll just mention maybe three. One would be there, I mentioned already, chapter four, where Krishna doesn't say, you know, Vishnu takes human forms and comes as Krishna, Rama, and so on. He says, I come into the world again and again. I, Krishna, come as Krishna. So it's kind of an absolute claim about who Krishna is. And then passages like the end of chapter 9 or uh, chapter uh, 1866, where Krishna says, you know, come to me. You know, the mom is very precise and very, that I'm the one. This, I'm, not, I'm not simply the, the one who gives you the map and tells you how to get to some reality. But there seems to be a further step, which is somewhat outrageous if one thinks he's just a prince, he's just an advisor. How can he say this about himself? And then one also, finally, my third example, has to be to, to deal with chapter 11, the Vishwa Rupa Darshana, uh, where Krishna, Arjuna innocently sort of says, you've told me all this, now show it to me. And who knows what he really expects to see, but then an increasingly terrifying vision because to see God in a sense is to die, as the Bible says as well. Uh, an overwhelming sense that everything is part of the reality of Krishna, who himself is time and death. And it, it seems hard to get a greater sense of Krishna than that, is this kind of absolute claims about him. So from the prince and the advisor and the charioteer to this increasingly amazing, astounding figure, there seems to be a course. Now, you know, step back and say, well, what does that say about Rama? What does it say about Shiva? or Devi, or Murugan, or Ayapan. I think it, it doesn't have to be taken in sort of a totalitarian fashion that if one reads the Gita, therefore no other pathway is possible. But rather, there is an absolute claim being made here that I think relates to our original theme of surrender, that if you follow the Gita fully, you're not just dealing with somebody you can give them a sign of respect and walk away at the end, but you're making a commitment that totalizes your life. And my teach, uh, who am I to say, I can't say, I can guess, would teach a Shaivite or a Tantrika to love God in a similar way in their own tradition, or an Advaitin to, to not be afraid to go fully into a state of higher consciousness. There's a push here, you're, you're talking to Krishna and then suddenly everything is at stake. That should be a lesson for all of us that the religious path suddenly everything is at stake and you either cling to what you have or you let go and go is really what moksha is about that's um so let let me in the last few minutes we have left uh, frank i want to be sensitive mm -hmm. to time let's talk about the situation where an individual hasn't started on this path of learning or hasn't experienced this, uh, whether you want to call it spiritual learning or you want to call it any kind of insights coming um, coming from these scriptures and does not have this concept of surrender at all in their mind. What difference does it make then for that type of an individual? And I'm, and I'm bringing this to more contemporary life now. An individual who really has not been exposed to any of this just goes on with their daily life. Um, too many things to do, bills to pay, <laughs> academic pursuits to pursue, right? Mm -hmm. Professional mm -hmm. careers to pursue. What, what, yeah. how would we, how would we even say, look, you got to look at this path of surrender it, because to me, it's pan religion, right? This concept of surrender to me, right. I mean, as you said, you know it very well, um, uh, as well, whether it's in Christianity or in this, it's pan religion. So what do we tell, how do we even, uh, convey this, that you need to think this way? Well, this is one of the great challenges for any kind of uh, people who have some mandate or opportunity to be religious teachers. 
Um, so, you know, discourses at a temple, uh, discourses, uh, programming such as you do all the time, which is so wonderful. Uh, me as a Catholic priest, I preach in the church on Sundays. Um, and, and, you know, both to the people who, who come and then to their family members who don't come indirectly. But the tension between affirmation and challenge, I think, is really important. And by affirmation, I mean that we, we, we cannot um, discard or despise the way people live their lives and struggle daily, uh, people trying to be good, people trying to do the right thing, but tensions and failures and um, you know, ups and downs and so on like that. All of this is the stuff of life. And I think uh, a truly spiritual person has to be a person of compassion and to be with people in their troubles and, and not simply scolding them saying, you can do more, you can do more, you can do more, but affirming people where they are and saying the point of our faith is to help you as you are where you are. But then also I think the challenge can be, but don't you see that there's a, a greater happiness you're yearning for, or there's a spiritual possibility that will give you a dignity that's not dependent on how much money you make or um, how prestigious your job is or you know where your house is or how big your house is. All of this stuff, I think, can tap into the idea that people are trying to be good and trying to be happy, and then they're at the mercy of all kinds of secular uh, consumer values even before we get to the hatreds and violence and discrimination and biases around us, that people on one level say, just leave me alone, let me try my best. And we should say, yes, we'll help you. But on another level to say, but the point of the faith and the point of the great scriptures and the um, stories and all that is to kind of say, but there's a door open there. You can go further in a way that some of these troubles will no longer bother you. Now that's all fine and good for me to say in my experience, place at my age. As you've raised several times, how do we say that to young people today? I think part of it would be realizing it's a challenge and then getting to know young people, uh, listening to how they tell their stories. I'm terrible on social media and so on like that, but to be online and to see what people are doing with you know millions of videos and so on like that, where are younger people today in their imaginations learning from them before talking to them or you know, telling them what to do seems to be necessary. And then working with them that there are people, you know, a, a good, much, much younger than me and younger than you who are trying hard already to be spiritual in an unfriendly world, to, to find those people and support them in what they do. But I think we have to be humble enough to learn from the young people before we start lecturing them. Yeah. Um, no, I, Thank you for that. Thank you. That's a good word of advice. Um, in the last couple of minutes, I, w I just want to, number one, humble and grateful that you took the time to, to go through these. I would love, actually, I know you're a very, very busy individual. At some point in this year, I would love to do a complete episode, just a Q&A on karma, because I think that is such a deep topic that um, this and, and answer some very practical questions on karma. And we can look at it both from, from a, a, a Upanishadic, Ramanuja standpoint, Shankara standpoint, as well as the Christian standpoint, and, mm -hmm. and look at the concept of karma. So again, mm -hmm. uh, not to put you on spot, but whenever possible, would love to do an hour on that. Yeah, that, and that would require, uh, we'd have to like talk offline, you know, prepare for it somehow. Correct. Because, uh, Karma has many meanings. Um, it, 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 when one begins to talk about karma and rebirth, for instance, then that becomes uh, often a dividing line between religions of the West and religions of the East yeah. in terms of whether rebirth is possible. And my own tradition, I'm a Jesuit in the Society of Jesus. Um, there were missionaries in the 16th, 17th, 18th century who thought that they could philosophically prove that karma was not rational and that people would realize that this doesn't make sense and then they would let go of karma theory. And then people pushing back, obviously. So it's a great complicated issue that would open up you know, views of life and death. What does it mean to be born? Uh, and then what does one do, that kind of karma in one's life? Uh, so that would be a great topic, but I think we'd have to think carefully about 
how to do it um, to make it work. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Frank, Professor Clooney, thank you so much for this. Really, thank you. Uh, uh, again, gratitude and, and with humility, uh, I really mm. hope this one hour that we spent, 52 minutes that we spent is of value to everyone. Uh, uh, if not anything, I think it will open up and allow individuals to inquire and ask more questions. And I personally will be listening to this again in the in the in the whole concept of Shravana Manana. And I want to make sure I'm listening to this video again myself to to embed that into my own thought process. So thank you again for this. Oh, thank you, Mahesh. I think um, I'm happy to have the, the opportunity. And I think you're doing great work by doing these kinds of videos. But you're right. I mean, watch it once. It's not like some quick show on Netflix or something. You watch it once and then move on to the next one. But the, the point of having is to go back and to think about it, to go back and raise questions. And then hopefully things you or I might say might help both us and others to go a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper. And then finally, Darshan, we see something that we hadn't seen before. And that Absolutely. is the God, I think. So thank you. Thank you very much, and okay. we'll talk soon. Okay, thank you. Take care.